no right to be ordinary. God has called you to be extraordinary. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm going to have you go ahead and have a seat this morning. There you go. I know you were all expecting me, like we have been doing every convo, for me to sing this morning, and you were going to stand and sing along with me. That will never happen. I promise you that. But today, we actually do something a little bit different. We, we have some guests we want to introduce to you, and then we want to introduce... Someone who's going to come and share their story, share their testimony as a champion for Christ, as a graduate here from Liberty. But before we do that, I want to introduce some guests that are in our community, are running for office, running for uh, to, to serve in Richmond, to represent this area in Richmond in government. And uh, we want to introduce them to you today. And so we have Senator Mark Peake, who's running for Senate in the state of Virginia. It's great to have you here today, Mark. And we also have Wendell Walker, who is running for uh, the House of Delegates in District 52 here in the state of Virginia from this area. And we also have running for the same seat, and, and by the way, that's a wonderful thing we have in our country, is that we can actually have two people who are running for the same seat, and they can actually come together, and they're not fighting, and they're not throwing things at each other. That's what freedom looks like. And so we have Jennifer Woofter, who's running for District 52 House of Delegates as well. And they have a lot of their staff with them as well. All three of them are going to be out on the lawn in front of Montview this afternoon. So you can go by and have a conversation with them to talk about what it looks like, what they depend on, what they believe in, what they want to do in Richmond to represent those of us right here in Central Virginia, which, by the way, all of you are part of this community, and they represent you. And so we encourage you to go by and talk with them. Uh, also, we have there on the lawn in front of Montview an opportunity for you to register to vote. Uh, you have up to October the 16th to register to vote, to make a difference, to make an impact. And so we encourage you to go by and have that conversation. But right now, what I want you to do is I want you to listen. Because all of you have the opportunity, you hear Dr. Costin, you hear me, you hear others talk about the fact that we have the opportunity and we have the responsibility to be champions for Christ in this country. That we have the responsibility to go out and make a difference wherever it might be, whether here, whether in America, whether around the world, to make an impact as a champion for Christ. And today I want to introduce to you uh, a, a guy who actually has done that. He grew up here in the Lynchburg area. He went to Liberty, graduated from Liberty, and now he serves in the House of Representatives in Washington, one of three former Liberty students who have served in, uh, in Congress. And so today, uh, we're going to have Bob Good come and share his story of what it means to be a champion for Christ on the political stage. Let's welcome Congressman Bob Good. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor Jonathan. It's so great to be back at Liberty. I sat here, well, not literally here, but near here 35 years ago as a senior, 40 years ago as a freshman. My wife, my now wife, Tracy, and I met in speech class, history class, back-to-back back to back years ago. And that was the best, at that point, five years of my life were spent on this very campus. Liberty means so much to my wife, Tracy, and I. Uh, I'm a twice graduate. I was here for five years as a full-time student, almost took six years, uh, but then we graduated together. She was magna cum laude, and as I said, I graduated, but I did go on to get my MBA here afterwards, and all three of our children graduated from Liberty, so we are as red, white, and blue Liberty family as you can get, and so it's such a great pleasure to represent Liberty University in Washington, D.C., and to be back here today to share a few moments with you this morning. I grew up, as Pastor Jonathan said, we actually knew each other as middle schoolers, uh, in elementary school for that matter, but I grew up in Lynchburg in a lower income family, didn't have a whole lot here, and had to work and wrestle my way through college. I know we got some wrestlers in here. I actually wrestled at Liberty uh, back in the day, but worked and wrestled my way through school with a finance degree, uh, and then went to work at Citigroup for uh, 17 years, was my first job after Liberty, 
and then had a chance to come back here and work in the athletics department and did that for 15 years to serve back here at our alma mater. Uh, before, I had others uh, ask me to run for Congress. And you know, one of the problems in Washington, D.C., is there's most of the people who are there, they've ambitiously or selfishly or pridefully pushed other people out of the way in pursuit of their political ambitions. But my wife Tracy and I, she knows that we prayerfully answered the call when others asked us to run for Congress uh, four years ago. And at that time, I was still working at Liberty University, and I'm sitting there thinking, how do you run for Congress unless you're independently wealthy or unless you're retired or, or you're already in, how do you do that? Turns out you quit your job and take a step of faith. And we did that four years ago and the Lord affirmed our path and we have the opportunity to represent you and more importantly, to represent him in Congress. You know, when we first ran, you know, one of my commitments was, Lord, help me to be more concerned about pleasing you than I am about pleasing others. Help me to be more concerned about offending you by what I don't say as a believer than I am about offending others by what I do say. And again, having sat as you are sitting today as a student at Liberty University, I just want to impart to you a few thoughts that, that, that I would share and I often share with younger folks when I have a chance to, to visit with them. Number one, take the long-term view. Life is about doing today what you'll be glad you've done in the future. N and not just eternity, of course, that's the ultimate measurement but also what you'll be glad you've done five years from now, 10 years, 20 years from now, and so forth. And college, which again was my, the best five years of my life at that time, but there is life that's even better after college. But college is about preparing you for life after college. So make the most. You've already been here long enough to know it's fleeting. It goes very quickly. But live with the end in mind. And you will never be in the future what you're not in the process of becoming today. So whatever your desire is that the Lord would have you be in the future, you have to diligently commit to being that today, becoming that today. How many of you believe, uh, first of all, how many want to know God's will for your life? How many want to know God's will? How many of you believe you can know today what God's will is for your life? How many think you can know today what His will is for your life long term? How many of you aren't going to raise your hand no matter what I ask? Okay, tricked you on that one. Some of you raised your hand. You know, God's will for us is actually pretty simple. And I can remember as a student being told, hey, you got to figure out the mystery of God's will for your life. And I remember saying, oh, I don't want to miss what God's will is for my life. You got to figure it out like it's a code to uncover. You know, God's will for all of us is the same. And all of us can choose to do what God's will for us is. His, if you read Scripture, to the degree that it depends on us, meaning God orchestrates things for us that we cannot control, but the things that we can influence, it's our obedience. It's our sanctification, which means holiness. It's our surrender to the Lord. It's, 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 uh, it's becoming more like Jesus. Our faithfulness, His will for all of us are the little things that are really the big things. So my point is you can know today that you are doing what is God's will for your life. And his will for you is no different than it is for me. And his will for me didn't change when my profession changed when I got to Washington. Now, it is also equally impossible for us to know what his will is for us long term beyond faithfulness, obedience, sanctification, and surrender. That's what he desires most of us. I get asked a lot too, now, what's it like in Washington? How do you stand it? Uh, you know, I, and, and I tell folks, the things that frustrate me in Washington are no different than they are from what frustrates you. It didn't change when I got there. The care that I have for the country, the concerns that I have for the issues, the battle is real, the evil that is there. However, God calls us all to the same mission and the same commission. You know, the Christian life is actually fairly simple. I didn't say easy. It's kind of like running a marathon. I know we got some distance runners in here. We wrestlers used to watch those distance runners uh, on campus. So we got some runners in here. How do you run a marathon? It's not complicated. Go that way for 26 miles, don't stop. So it's difficult, but it's not easy. The Christian life is somewhat similar. God calls all of us, if we have surrendered, we don't like that word very much. We don't like obedience and surrender very much. But God has called all of us, if we've surrendered him as Lord and Savior, to the same mission. 
to become more like Jesus, to bring Him glory, and to influence others for eternity. So when I graduated Liberty and went to work at Citigroup, I had a choice. Do I blend in or do I stand out? And my work at Citigroup, which to them was to help them make money, but to me was to bring Him glory and to be an influence to others for eternity at Citigroup. I came back to Liberty, and that was a little easier to apply that if if there was less resistance at Liberty University when I was here for 15 years. But when I got to Congress, it's the same thing. And I fall short, obviously. I miss the mark. But that is my desire, is to bring him glory through the platform that he has given me. And this week was a cra- I won't get into the political stuff, but I was, it's been a crazy week in Washington. And I had a few more interviews than I normally have. But my prayer each morning was, Lord, help me to make you known instead of trying to make Bob known. Help me to point to you instead of trying to make Bob look good. Lord, help me to be concerned again about bringing you glory and influencing others for eternity by what I say and how I say it. So I just want you to know it's such a privilege to be here. I appreciate Chancellor Falwell, uh, President Conti, for letting me be here today. Uh, Tracy and I love Liberty University. It's a privilege to represent you. And I just want to encourage you to take seriously the mission that you're being equipped to do here today, which is to become a champion for Christ. God has given you everything you need for how he wants you to be used today. He's also equipping you today for how he wants to use you in the future. Thank you and God bless you. Thank you, Pastor. Hey, if we could, we've got a lot of people that represent us in Washington, represent us in Richmond, represent us here in Lynchburg and city government. And while Bob is here, we're going to let him represent all of them. And let's just take a moment and let's just pray for wisdom. The Scripture tells us to pray for those who are in authority over us. And whether it's President Biden or Vice President Harris or any in Congress and Senate, any that serve in Richmond, uh, all of them, we are called by God to pray for them and to pray over them. And so let's join together right now, and let's just pray for the wisdom that they need to make the right decisions for our country, for our state, and for our city. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for the opportunity we have to be reminded of what is important, that we must represent you far before we represent others. As Bob has shared today, his heart was when he went to Washington to make sure that he did what you called him to do rather than what others expected or wanted him to do. God, we thank you for that spirit and that heart. And God, we just pray today for our president. We pray for our vice president. We pray for those in leadership in the Senate, in the House. We pray for those on the Supreme Court. We pray for those in, in Richmond, our governor, our lieutenant governor. We pray for all of those who serve and and the different areas of government. God, I pray that you would give them wisdom and guidance to make right decisions. Lord, that they would make decisions that honor you in everything they do. The scripture tells us that, Lord, even those in leadership, that you direct their hearts. And so, God, we pray that you would do that today. Lord, we pray for their protection. Lord, we pray that you would put your arms around them and encourage them when things are difficult. And God, we just pray that ultimately what we would see is that this is one nation under God. God, regardless of what we believe, we pray that you would take the division that is so present and that, God, that you would bring us together. We might disagree on issues at certain times with other people on the other side, but, God, even in that situation, Lord, we pray that you would help us to recognize and understand that we are here to love God and to love people. And for that, we give you praise. We give you glory in what you are going to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together and let's worship. We have confidence this morning. The battle's already been won. Come on, Sam. There's peace that our last dark. And hope that's in the blood There's future grace that's mine today That Jesus Christ has won So I can face tomorrow For tomorrow's in your hand And all I need you will provide Just like you 
just you have you. So I'm fighting a battle. You've already won. Say, no matter what comes my way, I will overcome. I don't know what you're doing, but I know. Your promise, you're coming back. You're my savior, my defense, great defender, hallelujah. There's no more fear in life, Lord. Come with me, come with me, come on, sit down.
University. My name is Summer Stubblebein, and it is my absolute honor to welcome the one and only Nancy Piercy to Convocation this morning. Nancy Piercy is a best-selling author, speaker, and a strong voice of truth within an American culture that is currently saturated by so many lies. At the beginning of this year, I discovered who Nancy Piercy was, and I began reading her book, Love Thy Body. This book has equipped me with all of the knowledge that I need to engage intellectually and compassionately on these controversial topics within our culture. I'm so excited to hear from her this morning, so please join me in welcoming Nancy Piercy. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me to share your worship this morning. I'm very honored by that. I was told that the theme for this uh, convocation is the soul of this generation. And there is no issue that has affected this generation more than issues of sexuality. 
So I've been asked to talk about my book, Love Thy Body, that you see on the slide, because in that book, I talk about issues of the sexual revolu revolution, from the hookup culture to homosexuality to transgenderism. So I teach apologetics at Houston Christian University. So my goal is to teach you how to talk to the secular world about these issues. Now, since the book came out, I've had easily a couple hundred interviews. And so I almost dream in interview format now. <laughs> and so I thought I would let you interview me today. Not literally, of course. <laughs> but what I've done is I've put together some of the most common questions that I've gotten from radio hosts, podcast hosts, journalists, and so on. So are you ready? <laughs> so, <laughs> Thank you. Good, you're ready. <laughs> um, so here's your first question. Debates over Christianity have changed in recent years. People are no longer asking, is Christianity true? They're asking, why are Christians such bigots? What do you, how do you answer that? Well, what I do is I turn the tables and I show that it's actually the secular atheist worldview that is harmful and negative. Why? Because it actually has a negative view of the value and dignity of the human body. Now that might sound surprising, so let me jump in with a couple of examples right away. It's most evident in the issue of transgenderism. Transgender activists argue explicitly that your gender identity has nothing to do with your body or your biology. So a BBC documentary says at the heart of the debate is the idea that your mind can be at war with your body. And in that war, who wins? The mind. Another video features a young woman who identifies as non-binary saying, it doesn't matter what living meat skeleton you've been born with, it's your feelings that count. So your body has been reduced to a meat skeleton. Jessica Savano is a male to female transsexual who created a Kickstarter page for a document titled, I am not my body. That title says it all. My body is not part of your authentic self. Okay, how many of you were raised on Blue's Clues? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah my, my kids too. So, did you see this? Did you see during uh, Pride Month, Gay Pride Month? Blue's Clues <laughs> did a gay pride parade. <laughs> <laughs> Which, yeah. Even, even toddlers are being told that biology gives no clues to your identity. It's even reaching down to newborns. So you guys know the term gender neutral parenting. <laughs> your parents don't always know this term, but I find that young people all know it. <laughs> So on the Facebook page for gender neutral parenting, it says point blank, there is no such thing as biological sex. Oh sure, people says bodies, chromosomes, genitals, but calling this sex is a social construction rather than a biological fact. This is serious biology denial. <laughs> and it leads to a radically divided fragmented, fractured view of the human person. It's sometimes illustrated with a little metaphor of two stories in a building, where biology is in the lowest story, and your gender has been moved off to an upper story, so tossed into an attic, where they have, the two have no connection. A Princeton University professor wrote a book on transgenderism, of course, I have to read that, I have to, because what the academics say is what filters down eventually to normal people. 
And the author said, transgenderism involves disconnect, disjunction, self-division, self-estrangement. Was, this was a defense of transgenderism. <laughs> Sounds like a criticism of it. <laughs> and then she said, the physical, what the real body, that is the physical body, tells us is nothing. It has no meaning at all. This is tragic. This is what schools are teaching young people today, that their bodies have no meaning at all. And what should our response be? As Christians, we should ask, why should anyone accept such a demeaning view of the body? I read an interview with a 14-year-old girl. She had lived as a trans boy for three years and then had detransitioned and reclaimed her identity as a girl. And here's what she said. The turning point came when I realized it's not conversion therapy to learn to love your body. This quote came out after my book was already published, but it would have been a great quote for a book titled <laughs> Love thy body. Even secular people, this was a very secular liberal website where I found this interview. Even secular people are starting to realize the answer to transgenderism is a higher view of the body. And that transgenderism as an ideology represents body hatred. Yeah. And what that means is that we as Christians have a wonderful opportunity to show that a biblical ethic is based on loving the body. It expresses a positive view of how God created us. The biological correspondence between male and female is not some evolutionary accident. It's part of the original creation that God pronounced very good. I'd better stop and let you ask a second question. Remember, this is an interview. <laughs> and not surprisingly, the next question typically has to do with the other hot button issue of our day, which is homosexuality. It turns out that the two issues are related because once again, the secular ethic devalues the human body. Think of it this way. Even my homosexual friends agree that on the level of biology, physiology, anatomy, chromosomes, males and females are counterparts to one another, right? That's how the human sexual and reproductive system is designed. To embrace a same-sex identity, therefore, is to contradict our design. It's to say, why should, my, why, why should my body have any say in my, in, in my identity? Why should my biological sex, as male or female, have any say in my moral choices? We have to help people to see that this is a profoundly disrespectful view of the body. It pits the mind against the body and says it's only the mind that counts. In fact, we can use that little two-story metaphor again. You see how it's, it splits the person apart. Now, some people say, well, homosexuality is based in our genes. And so they are being true to their biology. But there's no conclusive proof of any biological cause. The American Psychological Association says no findings have emerged that permits scientists to conclude that sexual orientation is determined by any particular factor, genetic or social. In fact, researchers have found that about 80% of people who come out as homosexual change their gender identity label at least once, you know, to, to heterosexual, bi bisexual, queer, and so on. At least once, 80%. That means for many of them, it's more often. 
That does not sound like a trait that is biologically determined. A magazine called The New Scientist said, it's time to get past the phrase, born this way. In religious circles, you sometimes hear it said that God makes people gay, right? Haven't you heard that? You know, God made me gay. But I met a former homosexual who said, if God makes people gay, wouldn't that make him a cruel God? Wouldn't he be cruel? Because what it means is that he has engineered their mind and emotions for attraction to the same sex, but he's created their physiology to be in direct opposition to that attraction. Would God create people to be torn like this in two conflicting directions? Not the Christian view of God. Things like conflict, self-division, self-alienation are products of the fall, not creation. And yet today it's widely accepted that if somebody feels that conflict between their body and their mind, it's the mind that counts. Your feelings and desires. So as Christians, how do we respond to that? Once again, we can ask, why should we accept such an extreme devaluation of the body. The Christian ethic is holistic. Our mind and emotions are meant to be in tune with our body. It's an ethic that overcomes self-alienation. It leads to an internal sense of unity and wholeness. In a real interview, I sometimes have to stop and let the interviewer <laughs> break in with another question. And at this point, what they often say is, you know, I was really surprised in your book by your claim that the secular worldview actually denigrates or demeans the body, right? That is surprising. You would expect if a person is an atheist and he doesn't believe in God, he thinks the physical world is all that exists, that he would think that the physical body is really important, right? But it's just the opposite. How is that? It's because the secular ethic rests on the theory that nature is a product of blind, purposeless forces, and therefore the human body has no intrinsic purpose that we are morally obligated to respect. Listen to how a, a, an outspoken lesbian defines homosexuality. On the one hand, she admits, nature made us male and female. Our sexual bodies are designed for reproduction. Did you catch that word, designed? <laughs> a strange word for an atheist. But if nature made us male and female, how does she defend being a lesbian? Watch her logic here. She says, well, why not defy nature? After all, fate, not God, has given us this flesh. We have absolute claim to our bodies and may do with them as we see fit. Do you see, do you see her logic there? If our bodies are products of mindless, purposeless forces, they have no intrinsic purpose. They convey no moral message. They give no clue to our identity. We may do with them as we see fit. What does the Bible teach? It teaches that nature was designed for a purpose. And science is on our side. It's evident to observation that living things are structured for a purpose. Eyes are for seeing, ears are for hearing, wings are for flying, fins are for swimming. In fact, the development of the entire organism is driven by an inbuilt plan or blueprint, DNA. So science itself tells us that nature exhibits a design, a plan, an order, a purpose. As Christians, we should stand out from the secular world by having a high view of the dignity and value of God's creation. 
In my book, Love Thy Body, I tell lots of personal stories. So let me give you one of them. Sean uh, was a young man, British, um, who was exclusively attracted to other men. But today he is married and has three children. Married to a woman. By the way, you have to say that these days. <laughs> um. and what, what's interesting about Sean's story is that he grew up in a gay-affirming family and attended a gay-affirming church. So he didn't think there was anything wrong with the same-sex attraction. So why did he change? Here's how he describes it. Sean says, I realized that as a man, God's original intention for me in creation was to be able to relate sexually to a woman. This remained true quite irrespective of whatever feelings I might have. And so he says, I did not try to change my feelings directly, which rarely works. <laughs> Instead, my goal was to acknowledge what I already had, which was a male body, as a good gift from God. And eventually, my feelings started to follow suit. So do you see his, what he, how his thinking went? He did not defy nature, as the lesbian said that I quoted. He accepted his body as fundamentally good. And that's really the question at the core of this debate. Do we live in a cosmos operating by blind material forces or a cosmos designed by a loving creator, which is therefore intrinsically good? Okay, back to our list of questions. Here's the next one. You can't raise these issues without somebody asking, what about intersex? What does that even mean? <laughs> the word intersex is a condition where a person's reproductive anatomy is atypical or anomalous due to a malfunction in their genes or hormones. Transgender activists like to use intersex people to argue that there's not just male and female, but there's also a spectrum in between. Is that true? No, there are still only two gametes. Any biology students here? <laughs> I had to learn this word too, actually. There are only two gametes. That means sperm and egg. There's no spectrum in between. And that's how biologists define male and female. So intersex people should not be used as political footballs by people who want to de de deconstruct the male-female binary. When I was writing my book, an intersex woman contacted me and told me her story, and here's what she said. She said, how do you think it feels being a pawn in someone else's game? It hurts to be shoved into the LGBT camp by either side. Okay, let's end with a question that all young people are facing today because we're all affected by the sexual revolution. So how does the hookup culture illustrate the way the secular worldview devalues the body? The whole premise of the hookup culture is that sex can be purely physical cut off from the whole person. In Love Thy Body, I include several quotes from college students, like this one from Alicia. She says, hookups are very scripted. You learn to turn everything off except your body. You make yourself emotionally invulnerable. A college student interviewed in Rolling Stone magazine put it this way. The mistake people make is they assume there are two very distinct elements in a relationship, one emotional and one sexual, and they pretend that there are clean lines between them. Do you see how she's almost verbally describing this divided, fragmented, 
fractured view of the human person? No wonder the hookup culture is producing a trail of wounded people. People are trying to live out a secular ethic that does not fit who they truly are. The Christian ethic is incarnational. What you do with your body is meant to be in harmony with who you are as a whole person. That's why, there's a reason for this, that the most complete and intimate physical union is meant to express the most complete and intimate union of a whole person in the whole life commitment of marriage. And once again, science is on our side. Science has been showing, the, oh, oh, I'm so sorry, I missed a slide. <laughs> okay, when I, when I was talking about the, I should have had my laptop up here after all. <laughs> I said I didn't need it. <laughs> okay, when we were talking about the hookup, <laughs> Think back to the hookup culture. <laughs> um, this was a young man who was interviewed in Rolling Stone magazine, and he said, sex is just a piece of body touching another piece of body. It is existentially meaningless. You see, once again, the secular view is telling young people, your body is meaningless. It has no meaning at all. Okay, so. <laughs> Science is on our side. Science supports the Christian view. Now, this, yeah, yeah, okay, good. <laughs> right slide. <laughs> so, so, even if you're not a science major, you need to know these terms. The interconnection of body and person with the discovery of bonding hormones like oxytocin and vasopressin. These are often called the bonding hormones because they create a sense of attachment and trust. A UCLA psychiatrist says, you might say we were designed to bond. Scripture teaches that humans <laughs> Scripture teaches that humans are embodied spirits, embodied spirits, and they're both part of our identity. This comes out beautifully in the parallelism of the Hebrew poetry in the Old Testament. My soul thirsts for you, my flesh yearns for you. Our soul has sunk down in the dust, our body cleaves to the earth. Keep my, my, my words in the midst of your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health to all their body. So the inner life of the soul is expressed through the outer life of the body. The Bible treats the human being as an integrated unity. Let's end with a few practical strategies. What if somebody in your family, your church, or here at Liberty, one of your classmates, is wondering if, there may, if they might be trans or gay, if they're questioning their sexual identity. In Love Thy Body, I tell the story of a young woman named Jean, who lived as a lesbian for many years, and today she is married to a man. <laughs> <laughs> And she has, two ch she has two children. So what was the turning point for Jean? Read this quote. I finally came to trust that God had made me female for a reason, and I wanted to honor my body by living in accord with the Creator's design. So here's my first strategy for you. Look at that language. Honor your body. Respect your biological identity. Live in tune with your body. Live in harmony with the Creator's design. Let's face it, Christians are known for having a negative message, right? It's morally wrong, it's a sin, it's against the Bible. 
and that's all true. <laughs> but we will win people's hearts if we learn to communicate a positive message that their body is God's creation and that a biblical ethic is showing us how to honor and respect it. <laughs> Second strategy, we can be proactive. Studies have found that the strongest correlate of both same-sex attraction and gender dysphoria is simply childhood gender nonconformity, which means kids who behave in a way that's more stereotypical of the opposite sex. In Love Their Body, I tell the story of Brandon. Brandon was a boy who suffered from gender dysphoria from a very young age. It often does start quite young. Before he was even walking, his babysitter said to his mother, he's too good to be a boy by which she meant he was gentle, quiet, sensitive, the things that we typically associate more with girls. When he was in preschool and his mother picked him up, every day he was playing with the little girls, not the boys. By elementary school, he was coming to his parents weeping repeatedly, saying, I feel the way girls do. I'm interested in the things girls are. God should have made me a girl. In his early teens, he was scouring the internet for information on sex reassignment surgery. So what did his parents do? First of all, they made sure they knew, he knew they loved him just the way he was. They did not try to change him. One of my friends is a former homosexual, and he said, when I was a young boy, I liked music and art and my father was baffled. He kept trying to toughen me up by pushing me into more traditionally male activities like sports. Brandon's parents did not pressure him to be different. They told him it is perfectly acceptable to be a gentle, sensitive, relational boy. <laughs> It did not mean he was really a girl. <laughs> His parents said, it may mean that God has gifted you for one of the caring professions, like counselor, psychologist, healthcare worker. His parents' favorite line, which they used over and over again, was, it's not you that's wrong, it's the stereotypes that are wrong. <laughs> And of course, it's also perfectly acceptable for a girl to be gender nonconforming, to be more assertive or interested in STEM subjects. <laughs> oh. In Romans 12, the gifts of the Spirit are not divided by sex. Prophecy and teaching are not masculine, as we might expect. <laughs> <laughs> Mercy and service are not feminine, as we might expect. <laughs> uh, Romans 1 says the Spirit gives them as, he, as he, dis he distributes them as he wishes. Finally, Brandon did accept that it is scientifically impossible to change your sex. He... And, <laughs> And, and, here's, and here's the science. This is a cardiologist, a TED Talk, and she says, every cell has a sex. Men and women are different down to the cellular and molecular level. <laughs> and obviously, you cannot change every cell in your body. So why have Christians not been more effective in dealing with these issues? It's, it's been... <laughs> no, no, no. 
No, that was a negative. <laughs> I'm, I'm, but I'm going to answer it. <laughs> um, why have we not been more effective? <laughs> it's because we too have a kind of divided way of thinking. Right? We call it the sacred secular split. Here's how one of my students put it. She said, growing up in the church, I was always taught spirit good, body bad. And, and, and so uh, strategy number three is to recover our own heritage. The early Christian church was born into an ancient Greek and Roman culture that devalued the material world, just like modern secularism does, though for very different reasons. The early church faced philosophies like Platonism and Gnosticism. Probably some of you know Gnosticism because uh, some of the New Testament books are written against Gnosticism. These isms treated this world as the realm of death, decay, and destruction. Gnosticism even taught that there were several levels of deity, spiritual entities, and it was a low-level God, an evil God, who created this world. It denigrated the, bo the body as the prison of the soul and defined salvation as escaping from the physical realm, to leave it behind. So in this context, Christianity was revolutionary. It taught that the material world was not created by some low-level deity. It was created by the supreme God, who is a good God, and therefore creation is intrinsically good. And yes, the world has fallen, but that's like a beautiful artistic masterpiece if a child comes with a magic marker and scribbles on it the original beauty still shines through. Then the greatest scandal in the first century was the incarnation, the idea that that same supreme deity had actually entered into the realm of matter and taken on a physical body. So the incarnation is the ultimate affirmation of the dignity of the human body. <laughs> What's more, when Jesus was executed on a Roman cross, we might say he did escape the body as Gnosticism taught we should aspire to do. But what did he do then? He came back in a physical body. <laughs> to the ancient Greeks, this was not spiritual progress. They literally argued, who would want to come back to the realm of the body? The whole idea of the resurrection of the body was utter foolishness to the Greeks, as Paul puts it. And what's going to happen at the end of time? God's not going to scrap the physical world as if he made a mistake the first time around. No, he's going to restore it and renew it, creating a new heavens and a new earth. And you and I will walk that earth with renewed bodies. So from the beginning, from the beginning, the Apostles' Creed has affirmed the resurrection of the, of the body. Good, good. This is an astonishingly high view of the body. There is no other religion, no other philosophy that has anything like it. You will never read these verses the same way again. <laughs> Honor God with your bodies. Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. I'm going to end with a story. There's a woman named Laura Perry who transitioned to male identity and successfully passed as a man for 10 years. And then she converted to Christianity. And at first, she thought she could continue living as a man. You know, sanctification takes a while sometimes. <laughs> and here's how she puts it. She said, I aspired to be a real man of God. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
But one day, when she was praying, she seemed to hear God say to her, you cannot claim to love me and yet reject my creation. <laughs> and she knew, she knew what that meant. She meant she could not continue to reject her biology, her body. And today, Laura is living as the woman that God created her to be. So the answer to the secular worldview on issues of sexuality is to build a Christian culture that loves God and loves his creation. And that's why you're here at Liberty. That's your job. The good news is not just salvation. The good news is creation. That God created you, body and soul, soul and body. And that he calls you to love your body. Thank you very much. And <laughs> So can I lead us in prayer? <laughs> thank you. Lord, I thank you so much for the young people that you've brought here to Liberty. I thank you that your spirit is working among them, that you are sanctifying them, that you're teaching them your truth. And we pray that you would equip them not only to live here at Liberty, but prepared to face the secular world to bring your truth out into the secular world and to show that your truth is life-giving and body-affirming and gives us the, a true strength of your truth and your wisdom. Thanks so much. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Hey, can we thank Nancy Piercy for being here today? What I appreciate so much, hang on, before you guys leave. What I appreciate about Nancy and the reason that we brought her here today is that so often in culture, these kind of conversations happen in a social media vacuum, highly charged and emotional, when in truth, so much of what we see in culture has its roots and the philosophical and the academic that has given birth to it. And I want to thank Nancy for decades of engagement at that level. Would you join me in thanking her? Nancy's going to be at the bookstore this afternoon at 12.30. If you would like to meet her and ask a question, we'll also be selling her book, Love Thy Body. Thank you guys so much. Have a wonderful weekend. You're dismissed.